Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Alex Brubaker. I'm the manager here at the Scholar. And as always, I am live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the bookstore. Whether you're joining us on Crowdcast or Facebook Live or even YouTube Live, thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to our live stream series where we host authors and speakers and we keep the conversation going about books we love. Our featured book this evening is How Fascism Works by Jason Stanley. Here it is. If you haven't yet purchased the book, I'd like to encourage you to do so. Purchasing Jason's book through us helps support the author, our staff, this event series, and it helps the bookstore continue to run during this strange, strange time that we're in. We're offering free medium mail shipping in the US for a limited time to make the price a little bit more reasonable for you. So if you click the green button below, it's right below my face, it will direct you to our website to purchase a new copy of Jason's book, which includes a signed book plate from him. We also have a book bundle option if you'd like to purchase both On Tyranny and How Fascism Works for a discounted price of $25. If you're watching this through Facebook Live or YouTube Live, look in the comments section and you should see we've provided a link there as well, or simply head to midtownscholar.com. Now I've got to get some quick plugs in here, but I'll make it quick. Uh, if this is your first time with us, I'll tell you briefly about the bookstore. We are located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as I mentioned before, just a few blocks down from the State Capitol building. We have over 200,000 books in our store inventory and over 15,000 square feet of space across five levels. If you're ever in the area or driving through the area, or maybe you're interested in a bookstore road trip in a post-pandemic world, we'd love to have you visit and get lost in the stacks. I'd also like to make a quick plug that we host many of these live stream events on important topics like this one here. If you give us a follow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it should be up there somewhere. It should be a green button that says follow. Click on that and you'll get updated every time we go live for an event in case you want to join. Now on to our program this evening. We are honored to welcome best-selling authors Jason Stanley and Timothy Snyder to our live stream series. Timothy Snyder is the Levin Professor of History at Yale University and the author of the books On Tyranny, Black Earth, Bloodlands, and The Road to Freedom. His work has received the Literature Award of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Hannah Arendt Prize, among many other awards. He lives in New Haven, Connecticut. Now, if you're familiar with Snyder's work, you know he is one of the most brilliant minds writing today, and so I'm excited to share with you that he is coming out with a new book later this summer. It's titled Our Malady, Lessons in Liberty from a Hospital Diary. In the book, Snyder traces the societal forces that led us here and outlines the lessons we must learn to survive. Be on the lookout for his new book later this summer. Check it out, and maybe in a few months, uh, we could find ourselves hosting Timothy once again, to be continued. Um, our featured author this evening is Jason Stanley. Jason is uh, a professor of philosophy at Yale University. He is the author of five books, including How Propaganda Works, which was the winner of the Prose Award in Philosophy from the Association of American Publishers. Stanley serves on the board of the Prison Policy Initiative and writes frequently about propaganda free speech, mass incarceration, democracy, and authoritarianism for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Boston Review, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and The Guardian. Of course, Jason's new book that we are here for this evening, again, is titled How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. I'm going to leave you here with one quote from the inimitable Claudia Rankin, the acclaimed author of Citizen, who everyone needs to read that book right now. Uh, she says, no single book is as relevant to the present moment. Now, quick note before I hand it over to Timothy and Jason, due to the large viewership and potential distraction of the group chat, we took questions from the audience members beforehand, and Timothy will use them during the Q&A. So the Ask a Question button in group chat will not be in use for tonight's event. Uh, but I assure you, we have some great questions for Timothy and Jason from the audience. Finally, without further ado, please join me in welcoming onto the screen, Jason Stanley and Timothy Snyder. All right, thank you very much. Um, thanks for that wonderful introduction. I couldn't be happier to have the chance to talk to Jason Stanley about his book. Um, usually when a, a uh, uh, the, the paperback comes out, one struggles to find reasons why there should be a paperback. You know, the paperback's cheaper than the hardback. Uh, paperback's easy to carry around. In this case, we have a paperback edition where so many things that the author wrote in the hardback have proven to be true. We have a paperback edition, uh, which basically is an answer to the critics of the hardback edition, because reading two years later, as I just did this afternoon, one sees how many of Jason's instincts, how many of his predictions, how many of his feelings about the way the world works have turned out to be, unfortunately, really justified. But for me, um, the, as a historian, and as someone who's worked on fascism, and this is where I'd like to start, the, the most interesting thing about the book is that it defines fascism 
in a new way. Uh, most of the time you have fascists who say we're fascists, or you have people on the left who say that other people are fascists, or you have scholars who try to define fascism, which is very tricky because fascism is against reason. It's very hard to know what it is. What Professor Stanley has done in this book is to, is to talk about how fascism works. And that even in the, so what I'm trying to say is in the title itself, we have a big breakthrough here because what Jason is doing is that he's defining fascism as something which is at work in the world, which is out there in the world happening. So I, I, I'd like to start with that. I wanna start with this notion of fascism working. So Jason, what does it mean to say that fascism works? So fascism is a way, it's, it, it's, a, it's a set of methods, a social movement, if you will, a set of practices and habits, ways of talking, as Victor Klemperer urges in the language of the Third Reich, LTI, ways of talking, ways of thinking, ways of narrative structures of representing your enemy, uh, narrative structures of representing your history and past that attract support, uh, that attract supporters uh, who are compelled by this vision. Uh, and there are many political, social and political movements that operate to change the way we think. Uh, and I think of fascism as one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's not a regime. If, if, we, if we think of it that way, then we're not really stuck. We can recognize, say, what Toni Morrison urges us to recognize in her 1995 Howard University speech, Racism and Fascism, that we can talk of fascist forces, uh, fascist solutions to problems. And so even though you live in a liberal democracy, you can have fascist things happening, fascist mechanisms, fascist forces. Uh, and for example, one of the examples I give of fa a fascist force in the United States is the 1990s when both political parties demagogued on crime. Uh, and uh, uh, using racialized terminology to demonize another. And so that, that is a fascist force in, in, in a society, uh, in an American society that at the time uh, many regarded as fully stable. Yeah, this, this seems to me to be a, a very important and analytically rich point. There's, there's a tendency, I think, both in scholarship and in the world at large to imagine that you know, fascism is something that you either have or you don't have. So, you know, the, the Reichstag was set on fire and at that moment you had fascism. The, the um, uh, Mussolini's followers march on Rome, at that minute you have fascism. And then the moment the Second World War is over, no more fascism. And yeah. in scholarship, there's this, you know, there's this really, I think, lazy um, uh, tendency to say, well, as soon as, you start talking about fascism, you must be making a comparison. It must be some liberal democracy in the abstract versus some fascist regime in the abstract. And what's interesting about your doing for, what you're doing for me is that you're saying, no, there's a bit of fascism here and there. You just said in words, in deeds, in practices, I would say, I would, I would venture even to say in, in human nature, in the tendencies of the things that we tend to fall for, you know, one, one interesting thing about your book is that you, you use classical sources sometimes as well, right? So I, I'd like to hear what you think about this, because I think we have a way of making everything safe by saying, well, fascism is something that we compare ourselves to. I think yes. that's a way of safe playing, because the moment you compare yourself to something, you're saying, I'm not it. I might be more like it or less like it, but I am not that thing. I'm making a comparison, right? There's this kind of false sovereignty about making comparisons. Whereas it seems to me that what you're doing is you're saying, there's some of it here and there's some of it there, and you have to look all around and you have to look at yourself. Yeah, I mean, in political philosophy, we think of, the, you can think of democracy as different things. You can think of it as a method of voting. You can think of it as a set of institutions, and you can think of it as a culture. Very often in the fascism literature, when people talk about fascism, they're thinking about fascist institutions, the Gestapo, the concentration camp, uh, the, the, what you, uh, I believe, in your work, I mean, in your work, emphasizes as the Nazi institution, the concentration camp. So you look for the emergence of those institutions, and institutions are part of culture, of course. But if we think of democracy as a culture, then we should correlatively think of fascism as a culture, as something that uh, 
that you know respect uh, lack of respect for truth for instance um, uh, is one element of it uh, so that way of thinking of it it's clearly not going to be an all or nothing thing and it's going to have family resemblances to forces in Western political thought that do date back to say book eight of the Republic of Plato's Republic mm -hmm. I want to I want to I want to pause on something I think that you said which was very important namely this the, the relationship between culture and institutions i think there's there was a very strong impulse in this country in 2016 and i think there's a very strong impulse in general in places where there's a kind of complacent trust in liberal democracy to say look we can't be moving towards authoritarianism or tyranny or fascism because we have the right institutions and one one of the points you make in your book is that a number of places which end up being fascist also had the right institutions until they didn't anymore. And this strikes yeah. me as a very interesting point in political thought actually, because some analysts would like to say, all we have to do is look at the institutions. The institutions are facts in the world. They're like rocks in the field. They're either there or they're not there. But the kind of analysis that you're putting forward, where you put an emphasis on culture, and I would even say responsibility, suggests that you can't halt political analysis just at the rocks in the field, just at the apparently objective facts about institutions, but you have to add in mood and responsibility and the choices that people actually make. Um, question mark. That's right. The institutions supervene on us. So, you know, the culture and the institutions, the culture and the institutions. I mean, we have to, if we're going to pay attention to changes in the institutions, changes in policy, which is what we need to do now. The book came out, I wrote the book in 2017. Uh, it was about fashion. It was about the movement stage of, of uh, you know, an early movement stage. Uh, you know, Arendt distinguishes the movement stage of, of total of authoritarian uh, regimes from uh, authoritarian movements from the power stage. So I was looking at it in 2017, and one needs to look at the way the change in culture changed the policies. So look at, say, the travel ban. When the travel ban in the United States happened, and people rushed to airports, everyone was like, "Here's this dr dramatic, unthinkable thing," but fortunately, we prevented it. Well, then it just got passed through a conservative Congress when you, uh, uh, a, I mean, a uh, conservative uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, once a few members had been changed, then uh, with two countries added, with, with North Korea and Venezuela, I believe. And now they've added even more non-white majority countries. So, and no one thinks about it anymore. It's the change in policy. And those changes in policies we're starting to see, for instance, with the coronavirus being used to change our policy, to move the attack on immigration from undocumented immigrants to legal immigration, which is where we have it now. So it's that the movement from culture, the culture invariably moves to the institutions. And obviously we're seeing that with the culture of loyalty, uh, the culture of, uh, I mean, the fascism literature, the classic fascism literature emphasizes the comparison between mob organizations and uh, fascist organizations. So loyalty and, uh, and uh, you know, co-opting the system for your own ends. Uh, so we would expect to see this using this frame. Yeah. I mean, I think there's there's something maybe even in more profound in the argument that you're making, which is the the relationship between fascism and and individualism. So if, if it's all about the institutions, then what individuals do, do doesn't really matter one way or another. Institution, individuals will say, well, the institutions are gonna protect us. And then when the institutions actually don't, or when the institutions are subverted, as you've already given some examples of, and move us in the direction of authoritarianism or fascism, then we just say, okay, well, that's what the institutions did. This must be normal. And there's no point along the way where the individual says, actually, democracy is the responsibility of the people. Actually, yeah. there's something that I have to be doing here. And that strikes me as a deep way that fascism wins. Um, fascism says, look, look what everyone else is doing. Look the way the wind is blowing. Look, look the way the institutions have been bent. And then finally, look at what the leader is saying. And there's never any moment where the individual 
makes a decision. And this strikes me as being very profound because if you want to take traditions of freedom seriously, they have to involve people doing unpredictable things, doing things that other people don't want them to do, which are surprising and fresh and new. Um, and, it's in, and in your analysis, you know, I think fascism precisely creates, tries to create no moment where that seems possible. Right. It tries. It tries to create. Well, it it it. Uh, I mean, one of the things one of the things you're saying about how institutions get corrupt, get how institutions whitewash fascism. I think you can have you. There's an example from our own history. Uh, Naomi Murakawa argues this uh, in a recent book that uh, the 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 first civil right, where she argues that liberals left Nixon. Uh, expanded an expanded system of prisons which he then used and exploited for various purposes uh and the the fact that it was an institution prevented people from seeing that it had been co-opted for these purposes and i think that's at the phase that we have to that we have to watch out for people call our attention to the people on the streets they call our attention they're they're, they're saying well there's there's not people you know, there's not those people in Michigan didn't shoot anyone. Those people in Michigan uh, didn't become violent. There's not fascist militias actually on the streets. Yeah, but our institutions, our uh, our immigration system, uh, for example, uh, many of our institutions have become uh, twisted. Our judicial system, our our judiciary, have become twisted in a way that uh, that sort of whitewashes what's going on which is not law and order it seems <laughs> yeah 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 i mean this may be more ho my hobby horse than yours but what i find really striking in that way of seeing things is that you you you, you have to be able to have some some moral point of reference where you say that law is a bad law yeah or, that institution should not be doing what it's doing because otherwise the, the the inertia of the change of the laws and institutions just moves you along. You use the word Gleichschaltung in your book yeah. several times. That was the Nazi the Nazi term for taking what was and slowly molding it into what we want it to be. So what, what I what I find interesting here is that you need some moral point of reference to criticize the whole thing, right? Because otherwise you just otherwise you just drift along. The laws and the institutions can be subverted, um, which is a powerful point. In, in your book. One of the nice things about your book is that it's in each chapter, you're always at a certain historical point where something happens, as opposed to fascism just kind of coming on the scene abstractly. Yeah. But I want, I want to push this to you in the form of a question. So presumably, if we read your book, you know, we're, we're going to be anti-fascists. In, in, I'm going to try to use the word anti-fascist without any clouds around it, right? Without any, you know, implications. Let's just imagine that yeah. we're against fascism for the time being. The question is, how do, how is one against fascism? So if you think about anti-fascism now, historically, like that term in the 1920s and 1930s, you can be an anti-fascist then um, if you were a communist or a sympathizer of communism because you thought history was on your side. There's going to be a working class revolution. There's going to be a national revolution. So being anti-fascist meant being on the right side of history. And weirdly, something similar happens after 1989. After 1989, it's no longer the working class, it's the bourgeoisie, right? But you're still thinking there's not going to be any fascism, history is on our side, capitalism is going to bring about democracy, right? So being an anti-fascist after 1989 just meant, hey, history is on our side, there's an automatic relationship between capitalism and democracy, so you didn't have to do anything, right? So being an anti-fascist in the 30s or in the 90s just meant accepting what you thought was a natural flow of history. Okay, so what does it mean now? What does it mean to be an anti-fascist? Ah, uh, that's that. Is that. I mean, as you know, there's there's a war in the literature between Roger Griffin makes a distinction between liberal anti-fascism and Marxist anti-fascism, <laughs> and that's what you've just. Uh, and uh, Marxist anti-fascism connects fascism to the business elite, uh, capitalism. Liberal anti-fascism is almost the reverse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, as you've sketched, so what does it mean to be an anti-fascist now? And what do you have? What's the situation where you have um, people like Madeleine Albright and I, who are very distinct in our ideologies, both critical of something that's happening? Um, so, uh, so that's a deep and profound question, and it's made more profound by the need 
for people with my left politics uh, to unify with people who don't share my Marxist analysis. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so for me, looking at around, looking around the world right now, using some of your work on Russia and Eastern Europe, and uh, it looks like you do have this mob organization uh, connection to uh, that that is in the old school fascist literature, um, and unfortunate, and so there are these. Uh, oligarchs and billionaires and oil companies who have interest in breaking down uh, international agreements, interests in weaken interest in weakening states, keep the oil flowing, don't move to renewables. It seems there's a lot of a lot of tech uh, tech involvement uh, as well. Uh, there's a, a lot of Silicon Valley far right. Um, so uh, so how do you uh, how do you think with that? Given that um, you also have you you also have uh, this nativist uh, appeal to the heartland uh, politics. So uh, so what is a, I think that you don't. Uh, my own view is that uh, I am sympathetic to the old school leftist analysis, anti-fascist analysis that you you have to address. Uh, I mean, the fasc fascist politics involves a certain frame. There's chaos in the streets. The minority group are causing chaos. You need a strong leader to protect you, to, to enforce these, these traditional hierarchies. Uh, and, uh, and so anti-fascist politics involves addressing the underlying conditions that lead to people uh, you know uh, that lead to uh, that 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 lead to radically unequal treatment and conflict. Mm -hmm. So I think an anti-fascist politics is an education system, <laughs> health care, <laughs> universal health care, uh, dealing with racial, long-standing racial inequalities, uh, so that uh, so that uh, so that people don't feel tempted into this kind of into the kind of fear. Uh, mm -hmm. and insecurity uh, that leads them a lot to be tempted by this politics. Yeah, I mean, the in, the inequality part is really interesting. And I, I, in the 20s and 30s, since you made reference to the Marxist analysis, in the 20s and 30s, what a lot of Marxists said is that fascism is nothing more than the, the, the crumbling sound that capitalism makes. And, if, and I think that's an, an underestimation or, or it's an overestimation of people, right? I think fascism has a lot to do with yeah. certain ways that people like to express themselves, certain ways that people feel comfortable. But one part of their analysis, which maybe wasn't so true then, but which is I think more true now, and here I'm agreeing with something you just said, is, is the focus on inequality of wealth. Um, exactly. it, it's, it is really striking that this time around, an awful lot of the push, especially the half visible or invisible tech push, is coming from places which have huge amounts of concentrated wealth, whether that's a Russian oil oligarchy or whether that's people who've made a lot of money on the stock market using linguistics, or whether that's you know whether that's Silicon Valley, as you've already said, yeah. huge concentrations of wealth then reach out and they seem to only affect. This is interesting. They seem to only affect politics in one in one in one direction, and I, I wonder if that can also be put in, in in terms of some kind of inequality of 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 access to factuality or inequality of access to truth um because the the centralization of of emotion on the internet has coincided with time in time with the collapse of local newspapers which means that you know people are drawn into these nodes of emotion but they don't really have so access to what's going on around them so it seems like to me that i mean i'm echoing your point but an anti-fascist politics would involve not just education but helping people to live in the world around them, right? Helping people to have access to facts. Uh, there's helping people to have access to facts and then there's also norms about facts and yeah. giving yeah. facts uh, the, the, the weight they should have in public discourse. Uh, you find for liberation movements uh, focusing on factuality and the, the mm -hmm. United States has a glorious tradition of this. Ida B. Wells fought, uh, fought the uh, attack on the horrific spate of lynchings in the South by documenting 
uh, all the ca as many cases as possible in the newspapers and and exhaustively showing that it was a myth that even not even one third of the people uh, uh, lit, who, who suffered that fate were even accused of rape. And so uh, so and she gave an ideological analysis of uh, of the structure that enabled this myth. Uh, so you have to have factuality. You have to have uh, you, you because we lay this ideology so easily on events uh, that uh, that ideal and what's dangerous about our situation in the United States. I mean, you know, in your own work, you say, oh, people think they're not we're not Germans, but the Germans were incredibly educated. Same with us. I mean, we have this law. Well, I mean, we're equally susceptible. We have this long history of seeing, say, black political protest always and in, in in the I mean, not we, but uh, but many Americans can only see this because they've been taught a history that erases the protest movements in the 1960s in Detroit and Watts and LA. And so you can paint what's going on, uh, you know, just as you can paint immigration as some kind of uh, uh, invasion. Um, you can paint them in these ways. And that's, that's why we need factuality to sort of break through the narrative structure that's trying to be imposed. I mean, if you look at the imposition of the narrative structure of, say, QAnon, that's happening right now, where the mm -hmm. Justice Department is trying to re reverse engineer QAnon by creating a narrative, cherry picking past uh, things from the past to sort of map it on. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of thing that that you do when, you know, there isn't respect for reality and there's just uh, it's just competing narratives. Yeah, no, it's a it's a pro I mean, it's, it's a profound it's a profound point. Um, I mean, the, what the word narrative reminds us is that there are certain stories that we like to hear. I mean, we like to hear that right. we're the good guys. We like to hear that we're innocent. We like to yeah. hear that when we make mistakes, to take one of your examples, when we make mistakes, they're just mistakes. But when other people make mistakes, those are those are crimes. Yeah. Um, everybody likes to hear those things. Yeah. We like to hear that we're on the right side. We don't be on the we don't want to be on the wrong side. Um, we like to forget our mistakes and remember everybody else's mistakes. And I mean, and it, it's a it seems to me that where your analysis tends is that fascism is actually a kind of attack on. Um, let's say some principles of reason. And the reason why I think this is interesting is that that's not how all left-wing people have addressed fascism in the past, right? There's a strong tradition. In fact, I would say until very recently, the dominant tradition, um, uh, let's say Horkheimer and Adorno or Derrida or Foucault, where there's a real hesitancy to, 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 to seize hold of concepts like factuality and truth on the logic that it was too much science and too, too a too rigorous attention to what was true that led to national socialism. So I just want to point out how very different your analysis actually is than some of those mainstays of, of, of critique of fascism. Yeah, I mean, uh, here's Du Bois and Black Reconstruction. Um, yeah. But are these reasons of courtesy and philanthropy sufficient for denying truth? If history is going to be scientific, if the record of human action is going to be set down with accuracy and faithfulness of, of detail, which will allow its use as a measuring rod and guidepost for the future of nations, there must be set some standards of ethics uh, in research and interpretation. This has been, a, a, it's a long tradition of uh, uh, philosophy of science, really, uh, in which uh, I'm standing. And folks like, mm -hmm. I think, Angela Davis and Noam Chomsky, uh, channel this uh, this history where factuality is is uh, is very central it's not something you give up obviously Ida B Wells and yeah. the, and then the work you just cited about uh, uh, perversions of reason is our colleague Jennifer Richardson who's done uh, who's done work showing who both of the studies you cited uh, are uh, are things that uh, are, are from her that uh, if you hear another group, is the cause Jennifer Richardson and, and co-authors? I don't remember the. You, if you hear a, if you hear if you hear a story about Europeans uh, killing Indigenous Americans, you remember it and more and re repeat it more accurately than if you hear a story about Americans killing Indigenous or you know Amer um, Amer Indigenous uh, Americans. Um, so uh, so we remember things better if it's other people doing the problems. Um, and uh, and and also right. Uh, so so I think we do owe that tradition. Like the authoritarian personality does give us 
uh, social psychology. Um, but I don't think you can do social psychology without truth, certainly not the kind of works that folks like Jennifer Aberhart or Jennifer Richardson do. Yeah, no, you're citing you're citing now again, as you did in your book, some very important American voices. There's there's I mean, as you know, there's another tradition, which is an anti-communist tradition, the, the Havels and the Mickniks right. and yeah. um, of the world who whose critique of totalitarianism was so very much is so very much applicable to our own world, actually, because what they were confronted with was precisely this paucity of truth and also this attempt to make the notion of truth it, uh, untenable. Um, and so they fought against it with like with, with with small factuality, with telling the truth where you could, and and by revaluating the truth itself. Um, so I mean, I, I I find that very interesting and powerful. But I think I also find it suggestive because it goes back to the question of how to be an anti-fascist. I mean, I think it says that to be an anti-fascist, you have to be tough. You have to recognize that the things that you want to hear are probably not true. And you have to recognize that the people who are telling you the things you want to hear are probably trying to oppress you. And you have to be tough. You have to be, you have to be able to say, okay, I'm going to look askance. I'm not going to be fooled. Um, it seems like there's a kind of, you know, the, 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 the fascism takes on itself this language that we're the tough guys. But maybe that's the opposite of the truth, right? I mean, maybe it's opposing that. Maybe it's being open to the truth. Maybe it's being willing to be challenged or to change your mind, right? Which is something that no one can do anymore. That the ability to change your mind actually shows a kind of toughness, real toughness, where what fascism is offering is, is the easy way out. Yeah, fascism involves uh, infallibility, invulnerability. And you see this with the uh, re reaction to COVID from say Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, uh, and dare I say it also in the United States here, uh, this idea that the chosen group is invulnerable, the leader is infallible. And in fact, what's difficult is to, as you say, accept a countervailing opinion. And the reason for the link between fascism and incompetence is because fascism involves not being able to hear something that contradicts what you want to believe. Of course, the powerful fascist leader seeks to just redesign reality so it matches with what they believe. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's perhaps a difference between fascism then and and the phenomenon we're talking about today. Because uh, you can re what it strikes me that you know someone like our our president is trying to redesign reality on the scale of our country. Right. But what he's not doing is throwing millions of Americans into Ukraine or Africa or you name it in order to in order to change the reality of of the entire world. Right. And that Absolutely. Like and that's a difference. As as Candace Owens recently said, if Hitler had just stuck to keeping Germany great, that would have been fine. Now, of course, I think it probably it would not have been fine. But but what we're having now is we're having a kind of isolationist. The one, you know, uh, these I'm in my book, I'm analyzing what I see as a phenomenon that's happening yeah. internationally. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are like we've already pointed out one interesting maybe difference. It's right now the Marxist analysis of fascism of this phenomenon looks really good and plausible <laughs> and uh, maybe more so than in the 20s and 30s. Um, but uh, but there is one difference is that in, in that these colonial wars are not the aims of fascism. And really, that's why I, I talk about fascism as a method, uh, one that can be divorced from uh, from its ends. Um, so, I mean, my ultimate goal is to talk about fascism as a rhetoric and, and, and as propaganda. But I think right now we're seeing the policies and the institutions change. We're seeing loyalist institutions. We're seeing. Uh, essentially fascist definitions of law and order. Um, uh, that's the con it's certainly in Brazil. Uh, so I think uh, it's not just rhetoric anymore. Uh, no. but there are certain things that the colonialism is a huge and important uh, difference. Although one can look at internal colonialism and see that it's a kind of a doubling down uh, on uh, settler on hierarchies inside the country, settler colonial hierarchies inside the country. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it, it, certainly, I mean, I agree with you. We're not just talking about, we're talking about rhetoric and about practices. I think the historical difference might be that places like Italy or Rom Romania or Germany were places that thought they were denied colonies. And so fascism was a last ditch attempt, especially in Germany, to have colonies inside Europe. Uh, 
Whereas now we're in, we're, 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 we're withdrawing from the world. It's a more, it's a post-colonial kind of, you know, it's a post-colonial kind of right-wing politics where the notion is not that we're going to spread our, we're going to conquer other people and spread our way to other people. It's that we're going to obsess about our own divisions. We're going to obsess about our own innocence. But I mean, it's still global because it's contagious, right? I mean, what the United right. States shows is possible is then done by other people. So it's, it's global in a very different way. I think, and I think the struggle for fascism and democracy has to be global. And we don't know what's happening with Latin America. I mean, with Central and South America. You know, what we've seen in the past few years is the advent of, of diverse governments, but certainly we've seen in, in uh, in Brazil, we've seen uh, the Trump of the tropics uh, arise and one of the world's largest democracies. So uh, so this, you know, these connections between the United States and uh, the United States interfering uh, in many countries in the world mm -hmm. uh, on one side uh, to press authoritarianism uh, might be happening. I mean, it, it's 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 not like it's um, it's certainly happening verbally. Yeah. I mean, one of I, I want to seize the occasion to say that one of the virtues of your book is that the cases are drawn from all over the world. Uh, it's not just the U.S. and Europe. It's not just the North. It's also it's also the South. And that 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 helps to make the persuasive point that what we're dealing with is a phenomenon. We're dealing with a possible possible ways of doing politics. Um, which are not only available to Italians or Germans in the 20s and 30s, but are, are available to different people and different times. In other words, that what you're describing is not just an absence of democracy or liberalism, you're describing a presence. Um, and I think you do that very persuasively. Um, it's, 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 it's wonderful talking to you. Um, I feel the absence of, of everyone else. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to go to a list of questions which I know have come from, from the audience. I started by you know, by making the point that that your paperback is very timely because um, you're 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 staying ahead of the world. Um, you're describing things as they're as they're happening. In just the last couple of days, um, we see the example of um, Mr. Trump referring to the bloodlines of of Henry Ford, who, as as you say in your book, personally paid to have half a million copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, the most important anti-Semitic tract published in the United States. Um, we, we see in Minneapolis, the police immediately handcuffing uh, or arresting a, a black reporter when his white colleague was a block away doing exactly the same thing, all of which of course was occasioned by the public murder of a black man in the city. Um, we, we, we see, you know, we see a new attorney general, your book is about, has, has attorney general sessions. We now have a new attorney general, Mr. Barr, who is actually much more articulate, I think, in returning to the fascist tradition that law is not about norms, but law is about us and them. And since they always attack us first, um, therefore, whatever we do is is, is justified. So I, I'd like you to just pick and choose among whatever contemporary events you found most striking, and then we'll we'll, we'll head it over to the uh, to the audience. Yeah, the uh, the contemporary. I mean, uh, I think the reaction. C certainly, uh, bars uh, the 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 use of the justice system to create uh, this kind of alternative reality. The sort of co-opting mm -hmm. of the justice system is a uh, and the sort of acceptance of that. No, all politics is combat. Uh, uh, the sort of the development of uh, some intellectual uh, versions of this mm -hmm. as far as far as as far. I think what we what we what we see recently, uh, in my analysis of fascism, my thinking about it, a lot of the people who support fascism are not fascists themselves. Mm -hmm. They just think the fascist, that well, th that this person, this tough leader, will get it done for them. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll get their goals done for them. So I think we've seen a, a, a very strong bond between people who aren't fascist uh, like uh, evangelical Christians, some many evangelical Christians, but a very sp strong bond between uh, them and the, and and uh, Trump. We've seen an enabling of ethno nationalist movements around the world. Israel, uh, uh, where where we're already talking about annexation. India, which is an example that occurs throughout the book. Um, Trump and Modi are very close. Um, 
uh, and so, uh, and we're we're seeing just uh, the escalation of the of these these trends. So I think there's there's one of the things that concerns me. I I, I suppose is that uh, Trump is going to be using world events in order to uh, run an election, to paint things in a certain way to run an election campaign, and uh, and I don't know how he's going to. If he uses this the law and order frame, I'd be very concerned with what uh, might happen, but. Those are all speculations. I think, like all of us, um, it's going to be an intense summer. Yeah. Okay. Well, with um, with that undeniable truth, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over, as it were, to to to, to the rest of you. I want to I want to thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank you for 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 supporting independent bookstores. Um, and I want to thank you for all of your questions. The, we we've had to choose just a, a few of them. And I'm going to let Jason have a shot at them, and then maybe I will. I might. I might come in as well. So the first question, which we have from Kate, is: When people think about fascism historically, what do they get wrong the most? Why don't you take that to first? First, I I think that so I'm going to give an unexpected answer to this. I think the thing that people overlook is the material. And in particular, the environmental, the ecological aspect of fascism. Fascism um, in the Italian, but most clearly in the German variety, was really was about land. Um, you know, the, the idea of blood and soil wasn't just a catchy phrase. The notion really was the world is finite. There are only so many resources. Humans are like animals. Um, races are like species. We have to compete or die. And that is a worldview. That's a certain kind of ecology which says, forget about the science, uh, forget about the experts, we're going to take the land. Um, that, that's I, that, that I think it's almost completely overlooked. And the reason it gets overlooked is that whereas the 20s and 30s were a time of shortage, um, a time when people really did go hungry, even in, even in rich countries like, relatively rich countries like Germany, we had the post-war bounty um, in the West, we couldn't imagine the material conditions could matter. Fascism then becomes a matter of, 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 of a kind of pure ideology, an abstract ideology, whereas a lot of it had to do with the earth. And this is relevant now um, because, of, because of global warming, right? Again, we're facing a choice. Do we care about the experts and the science and do we try to solve things in a way where everyone can benefit? Or at the end of the day, are we just going to take the water? Are we just going to take, take the fertile soil? Okay, so... You, you find this in Guillaume Fay's uh, in some of the so fascism. There's kind of a pure European tradition through France through the 70s to, to uh, recently. Guillaume Fay's Fay's Why We Fight. He talks about uh, which is a fascist French fascist tract from the from 2001. Uh, he argues that climate change will be the crisis that will lead to the starvation of resources and some nationalities will die out. And we just have to make sure we French people that we French people survive. And that mm -hmm. explains a lot of the closing of the borders talk that, you know, it's going to be a fight for water and resources and you want to privilege your group. Yeah. OK, there's a lot to say about this, but I want to make sure that some some other voices um, get in. The second question that, that came through is from Brett, who asked, um, has the societal creep of the use of the word fascism itself made it more difficult to point out actual fascist movements in 2020? Hmm. Uh, so that was always an initial worry with using the term fascism. Uh, but, uh, and the creep is always something, you know, it's, uh, I think as Tim points out, as Professor Snyder points out in The Road to Unfreedom, uh, that uh, that in Russia they were calling Merkel and Obama fascists, um, and so uh, so you know there's creep and there's creep. Uh, so uh, so uh, so I think that I I think fascism is always it's going to be overused because there's going to be radical ambiguity. There's, there's ambiguity. There's vagueness. Fascism appears in different forms in different places, uh, but that shouldn't be a reason to abandon it as a term of analysis. Uh, remember that when uh, Richard spent, there's a fight in the white nationalist circles in the United States around the expression alt-right. Uh, there's a fight because people, uh, people are arguing who gets credit for having introduced it into the mainstream. 
Um, so Richard Spencer claims credit, but uh, Greg Johnson claims someone else also gets equal credit. That's a win for them if you can rename white supremacists and white nationalists and frankly fascists as uh, a gr- after a grunt what sounds like a grunge band from seattle so mm-hmm. i think it's important to keep the terminology if and if you look at say guillaume fay or uh or the real right returns um daniel freeberg's uh far right sweden democrats book from 2015 you'll see they all start with what's called a political uh a, a meta-political dictionary and they they urge you they urge their uh, supporters uh, to introduce certain words, and they don't want you to use fascist. They they you know alt right would be um, you know they want. So I think keeping fascist in play is important. Yeah, one of the things I find interesting about about the about the book how fascism works is that it's about it's trying to create fascism as a phenomenon. So precisely a term of analysis as opposed to a term. Of, of abuse and it's hard for us to do without the phenomenon um we're not going to be able to tell talk it's not, it's not the only thing going on but without the phenomenon we're not going to without that name we're not going to get very far okay allison has the question what role does the rise of christian nationalism play in normalizing the extraordinary uh yeah um i recommend a book by uh, Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry taking America back for God uh, on Christian nationalism. Um, uh, it's played a big role in the United States and it's played a big role in Brazil, <laughs> uh, in both countries. And Hindu nationalism has obviously played a big role in, I would argue, the fascist ideology of uh, the ruling BJP party. Um, so, uh, so I think religious nationalism has played a big role and also I think in Israel it plays a role, a big role. So uh, a problematic role. So uh, Christian nationalism here has uh, sort of created a narrative around uh, Trump. Um, it's provided him with a base of uh, sort of a biblical narrative, provided him with a base of support. Uh, he's certainly been uh, uh, he's been delivering on some uh, priority things like uh, like uh, choice, like uh, um, uh, on cultural politics and. And so I think that there's, uh, it's played a large role. It's played a large role in Brazil as well. Uh, and if you look historically uh, at fascist movements, say, for example, in Brazil, um, integralism, which is considered a basically some kind of fascist movement, is a uh, Catholic, emerges from, far, from conservative Catholicism. So these links between, uh, between the religious right as opposed to the religious left, which there isn't obviously in Latin America and the United States and elsewhere. Um, if you look at these links between the religious right and uh, figures like Trump, they're familiar, historically familiar. Uh, okay. Go- yeah, quick point, Goebbels, just check out Goebbels's 1935 speech, Communism with its Mask Off. And uh, there you will see how he's shouting out and representing fascism as the soldier or warrior for traditional religion. Yeah, I mean, I, one wouldn't want to push the point too far, but it is it is interesting how Nazism begins as, as being profoundly anti-Christian, um, but as it works its way into power, um, cha- changes quite profoundly and um, oppresses a bit, but co-ops a lot more. And the confusion of you know a, a, de- a deity um, and and a leader and a führer is unfortunately a little bit more common than one might expect, and not just in Christianity. Okay, with that sort of ambiguous remark, I'm going to move on to the next question, um, which is which is from Andrew, who asks, and we've touched on this a bit. What is the greatest defense in modern society against the increase in fascism? Ah. Uh. Well, I think since you wrote on tyranny, you should write, you should answer that. Because I think that when I'm answering that question, I use on tyranny. Well, that's, 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 that's sweet. Um, I, I mean, I, I tried to, I tried to hit on this point earlier in our discussion, because I think your book also points towards it, that a lot of the defense against fascism is a defense against the kind of emotional collectivism. That is, you can't do what everybody else is doing. You have to figure things out for yourself. You have to do things that feel weird. You have to do things as an individual, which maybe make you more of an individual than you were before. 
you have to really care about the truth. You have to be kind of a geek about the truth, a nerd about the truth. You have to not be afraid that people are gonna make fun of you because everyone's cynical. I mean, this version of fascism, much more I think than the previous one, is cynical. Now, the other one said, the previous one said, there's no truth except the leader. And this one says, there's no truth and maybe not even the leader, you know, or whatever. Uh, so I, I think that the defense has to start with an affirmation of the of the individual. It has to, it has to include an affirmation of values, because if you don't have values, then the people who have the bad values are, are, are always going to win. But if it's if it's society, I'm going to make a big plug for um, an issue I think is massively overlooked, which is the local news. Um, the, 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 from Russia to the United States, there's a pattern around the world which shows that when local news collapses, people become much more conspiratorial and paranoid in their thinking. Only if, if you don't have local reality, then you don't have local conversations and suddenly politics is all about Washington and then it's all about us and them and then it's all about conspiracies, right? So it's, it's not dramatic. But finding a way to return commercial or non-commercial local news to this country, for me, would be a societal defense against fascism. Uh, unfortunately, Sinclair News, people talk, I mean, uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories say, you know, the communists and the Jews control the news. But in fact, Sinclair News is one of the largest owners of, uh, of local media stations, and they are strongly partisan. So returning, yeah. you, you have to fight fascism. And this is why on tyranny is so profound, one of the reasons, uh, by restoring a culture of truth. You can't have respect for truth. Uh, uh, and a res culture of respect for truth is not merely citing facts when they're useful, but right. engaging in analysis, because individual facts don't speak for themselves. You might say, uh, the, you know, this group of people it gets sick more easily from, say, the coronavirus. But if you just stop there, you don't explain why they're getting sick because they're more likely to be essential workers because there's uh, they, they live in crowded places uh, because of um, race of discrimination. So so you need to have a democratic culture of interrogating facts. Yeah, and yeah. How yeah. to return that to that is an essential question. Yeah, uh, that's very well put. I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more 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 questions. Um, so. Scott asks, how do we stem the tide of anti-intellectualism among contemporary youth and or rural populations? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think, uh, I don't know if there's an anti-intellectualism in rural population. I think there's a lot going on. And uh, uh, I mean, I think when I argue, so chapter nine of the book is called Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's about how this kind of politics uh, demonizes the cosmopolitan coastal elite in our country, uh, or demonizes the sort of uh, uh, decadent, you know, cosmopolitans and liberals in cities, uh, and appeals rhetorically to rural populations. But I think, uh, you know, I I think one way of fighting fascism, not just I think, uh, but it's essential to fight fascism that you have a cross-racial, class-based. Uh, union movement, labor movement. That's why mm -hmm. fascism attacks trade unions. Um, so both Du Bois in uh, Black Reconstruction and Arendt in, in Origins emphasize labor unions because they bring together rural and urban populations. They bring together, um, so, so returning to a class-based politics, a material politics. Everybody likes weekends. Can't we agree on that? Everybody would like health care. Um, we have to return to that. That, to me, right. uh, is, is really important. Yeah. I mean, with anti-intellectualism, I would, I would recast it in terms of difficulty of conversation. And I think conversation is easier when you have health care. I think conversation is easier when there's less pain, whether it's in the countryside or, or, or anywhere, anywhere else. Um, number six, from Derek. What do you say about the use of online platforms for fascist recruiting? And how should we properly think about the threat posed by the virtual far right extremism when we don't have a clear sense of their size or support base? Yeah, that's a great question. And Moira Weigel works a lot on this, a scholar from Harvard. Um, and there's a lot of research being done on this. One thing we know is that the far right is coalescing from different sources. And, and several of them are online. So the Gamergate community, uh, the sort of uh, 
uh, the sort of online misogyny and men, men's rightsy uh, uh, aspects of different online communities. Uh, Silicon Valley has been a source of support uh, for, uh, for some of these. Uh, obviously, organizations like Cambridge Analytica are backed by, um, by, uh, by well, I mean, there's a lot going on online to both intentionally and unintentionally to, to create the kinds of us, them distinctions that invigorate uh, the fascist culture. And I think Tim, Professor Snyder has a lot to say about this, having said in print, I believe that the internet is fascist. Yeah, well, the the internet is on balance fascist. I mean, I think one one of I mean, this is not this is not my book. This is Jason's book, but I I think the, on balance the internet is fascist because the, yeah. I mean, Facebook just disbanded a working group because the working group came to the conclusion that its that its um, algorithms were deliberately driving us them thinking. I mean, that phrase, which is a subtitle of Jason's book. Um, the, 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 the internet tends also to re finds the stories that we like to hear and then gives them to us. It finds the groups, the categories that we tend to belong to and then enforces those categories. And we don't even notice that it's happening, which is what's insidious about it. But I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this for long, but I think there are ways, I mean, the digital world has this aura of being objective and progressive, but the digital world has, if you look at basically any statistic from life expectancy to IQ, like whatever is your favorite one, it's it's driven us it's driven us backward in the last fifteen years. Oh, and democracy. In case you haven't liked democracy, you know the whole the, the the internet has been crushing democracy, not just in this country, but but around the world. Okay, I'm going to try to be I'm going to be just and get in all the questions. The very last one that I was given is from Daniel, um, and it's it's going to take me a couple of seconds to get it out. Uh, how do you respond to friends, family, and so on who act like saying this stuff is alarmism because Trump and so on aren't wearing Nazi uniforms and murdering people? I feel like we tiptoe around the F word and need to explicitly and concisely call out what's happening to us. But outside of a report that President Obama used the word in the private telephone call, I don't hear Democratic leaders, including Joe Biden, using the word, even though Republicans have no qualms of falsely accusing all Democrats of being socialists or communists. Right. So why aren't they? Uh, how do we rally the nation against fascism and beat it if we don't call it out for what it is? And how do we do that effectively for the people who haven't paid attention, aren't sensitive enough to this stuff to get it, or just don't care? So my cheap and easy answer um, is to go to an independent bookstore and uh, order a copy of Professor Stanley's book, because I think what it, the book does is it gives a name to a phenomenon rather than just name calling. Um, and this helps us to analyze politics in America and, and, and elsewhere. Um, but I'm going to give Professor Stanley the last word. Uh, I think that that uh, uh, was a gracious way to end. Uh, but but I think uh, the uh, I think what I try to do in my work is try to familiarize it, to, to try mm -hmm. to eliminate this thought that it's something that could only happen to Germans and Italians, to emphasize that uh, the phenomena the political phenomena that is fascism is something that, yes, it involves harshly condemning people as communists, uh, representing, you know, your enemy, the liber liberalism as a mask for communism. Uh, it, 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 it involves attacking tr labor unions, things, a structure that is modern, but it involves elements that go deeply into Western political thought. Uh, the desire to create fear, and for a strong leader to protect us from the very fear that he has created. Um, so, so, I think, uh, uh, so I think resistance to fear uh, is important. And I think American history can give us uh, examples in which Americans have in protest movements and social, in social movements, such as the civil rights movement, have faced down these demons before. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. All right, uh, we're about to wrap up. So I just wanna thank uh, Jason Stanley, Timothy Snyder. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here and having this really important conversation. Uh, the book is How Fascism Works. Click the green button below. That'll take you to our website to purchase a book. If you wanna purchase a bundle, we've got On Tyranny as well for 25 bucks. Um, thank you again. Thank you to our viewers. Um, and I'll give you Jason and uh, Timothy uh, the last word. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the bookstore for having me on. I, I wish we could be there in person and to meet people in Harrisburg. Uh, 
I'm from Syracuse, so it's, it's somewhat similar cities uh, to some degree. So, uh, uh, and support your independent bookstores because they too are the lifeblood of democracy. Yeah, I mean, books. All these questions about what to do about fascism, we have to, we have to get, we have, we have to do things in public. We have to speak the truth. But if we spend more time reading books and less time and less time on the internet, um, we'll also be doing our part. Professor Stanley, Professor Schneider, thank you again so much, and thank you to our viewers. See you everyone. Stay safe.